In a world of fake everything, one thing that's hard to find is real Christian people. They're out there, and we just happen to know a few. Sit back, relax, as I, Redwards Lou, interview Christians just like us. Hey everybody, how you doing? It's your host Redwards Lou, coming live from Cape Cod, Massachusetts on the East Coast. And it's Christians Like Us Day, it's Wednesday, hump day, all those days that you call whatever. <laughs> and uh, praise Jesus, man. I don't know what we have for a temperature here on Cape Cod. I think we have like 45 degrees, 45 degrees and cloudy and a chance of Christ's return. And praise Jesus for that, man. Hey, today, Christians Like Us, testimony time. We have Sheepdog from out in Western Mass, okay? The same state that I live in. I'm on one end, he's on the other. And praise God, man, he's, uh, we met him through Discord. He's on the Discord server with us. He's uh, serving Jesus Christ with us, man. He's a great blessing to us. He brings a lot to the table, too, man. And uh, we all learn off each other. He's throwing some stuff around. We're throwing stuff around. We're having a good time. But uh, anyways, we're going to bring him in here, and he's going to give us his testimony. And, uh, and then we'll see where it goes. So let's welcome in CJ here. I said CJ, didn't I? Sheepdog, CJ, you there? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it's all good, brother. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. You go by Sheepdog, though, on the Discord server, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll call you CJ, Sheepdog, whatever it is. We know it's you. Praise God, man. So how's things going uh, out there in Lockdownville in Western Mass? Oh, I'm blessed. The weather is... Uh... Not so wonderful, but uh, it could be worse. It could always be worse. Yeah, it could. It could. No, no tornadoes, no earthquakes. Uh, we nope. just we got cloudy weather here. <laughs> Praise <laughs> God, man. And it's not the middle of winter and snow blowing, but I think snow's blowing around somewhere in the country. But for us, it isn't. So I'll take it. Amen. I got plenty of toilet paper. I'm good to go. Amen. <laughs> Me too. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So, um, hey, uh, well, I don't know. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, so people can get familiar with you, you know, just basically, you know, who you are. Obviously, you're a guy, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, about maybe how old you are and stuff like that. And uh, and then we'll just work into, you know, seeing where you came from and uh, where you've been and where you're going. How about that? Okay, uh, well, I'm 41. Uh, Woo. Uh, I uh, was raised in a small town in Vermont, uh, in the woods, in a trailer with a couple additions added on, pretty secluded. I had like uh, maybe three houses that were probably a quarter mile away from each other in my area, and other than that, I was pretty far out of uh, the, city, or the town. Um, I grew up with just uh, a mother, my mother, uh, except father, and my brother, who was his son. Uh, so it was a very small family. Uh, my mother didn't work. She was a stay-at-home mother. And my brother's father, my stepfather, he uh, was a black topper. So he worked really hard, um, but he didn't make a whole lot of money. So... We basically, you know, um, we were really, uh, we didn't have a whole lot, uh, but what we, we did have everything we needed. Uh, we weren't, yeah, uh, we weren't really a religious family, but somehow I was introduced to God. I don't remember exactly how or where, but I always knew that he existed. So tell me a little bit about Vermont. I mean, I'm a little familiar with Vermont. Uh, you know, actually, my uh, stepdaughter lives up in Vermont. I've been to Vermont a lot. It's more southern Vermont, but I went to Burlington a couple of times and things of that nature. And I know New Hampshire and Maine, and it can get pretty isolated out there. So as a kid, I, I guess you were born in Vermont. Uh, how was it being a kid up in Vermont and being in a sort of a sort of isolated area where, you know, you only had a few people around. It wasn't like a big city, anything like that. 
Yeah, what was it like growing up as a kid like that? Well, actually, um, my mother had me really young. She was uh, 16, and she had me in Pittsfield, uh, Massachusetts, and then she moved to Vermont with my brother's father. Okay. But we were, we were uh, very, my mother was very overprotective, and, um, you know, I went to school, and I had friends in school, but I never really had any um, friends that got to come and visit, or I couldn't go to other friends' house houses because my mother was didn't want me out unless um, she knew their parents, but she wasn't, you know, we were so secluded that she didn't really know anybody. So it was just me and my brother uh, basically playing with each other, beating each other up, or whatever the, the day brought. <laughs> So what do you think your mom was afraid of? Was she afraid of, like, bears coming out of the woods or, or deer or something? Or was she afraid of just maybe someone snatching you up? Well, she was afraid of uh, afraid of us getting hurt uh, by people, I believe. she yeah. was. We got to roam free pretty much in the woods. I mean, not when we were really little. But, right. Uh, she was actually, you know, a really, like, she was young. So her and my stepfather they used to have like birthday bashes or they'd have like the whole they had tons of family and friends and they'd come over and they'd party and there was uh my uncles were in a band so they'd play on our on our port on our deck and they had keg parties and stuff and me and my brother and our cousins and stuff would run around but that's about the only socialization we got outside of school and that was maybe two or three times a year yeah so talking about school now didn't you know, being up there. How was school? I mean, I, I'm assuming you were born in the 70s or something like that. And, uh, 79. 79. So, you know, being a little further up, and uh, I'm trying to remember how things were in the 70s, a little further north, but uh, being out there now, did you have, like, the one-room schoolhouse type deal, or did, was there any kind of modern schools that you went to? What was it like going to school? It was uh, one classroom, one teacher, um, for most of uh, elementary, I moved around from different parts of Vermont. First, I was in Reedsboro, and then I moved. Um, Reedsboro was a little further north, and then I moved south to Pownal. Um, and when I was in Reedsboro, I think it was like till third or fourth grade. I think yeah. Fourth grade, um, and that was a small school. And then Pownal, actually, until sixth grade, was also uh, a small school. But I believe we had a couple separate classes, but not as many as they have now. Yeah, so after sixth grade, you went into something like a bigger school, I would assume, like a junior high school, something like that, right? Yeah, I went to uh, junior high. Um, yeah, Mount Anthony Junior High, which was seventh and eighth, but I stayed back in seventh. And then we moved to Pittsfield around six. I was 16, 17 when we moved to Massachusetts. So I had to redo seventh, and I went from a junior high to a middle school. Okay, yeah, I've I've experienced the doing a grade over because of moving thing myself. So, you know, how were you though? I mean, you talked earlier that with your brother you were sort of rumbling around, beating each other up, having all kinds of things like that. How were your relationships in school? Were they the same, or did you get along with everybody? How were you as a kid, you know, going through school? Well, I never uh, really fit into any category, so I was kind of bouncing everywhere. I had a lot of acquaintances. Um, I really got along with the the children that had a heart. Um, I mean, not that, you know, there's children that don't, but some, you know, in school you get classified or you get into groups or you know, some people hang out with other people, and I was never, I kind of just bounced around and was, tried to make friends with everybody, uh, and the people that picked on me, or, you know, because I, I had, I was poor, you know, I, I, I wore my mother's clothes sometimes to school, you know, because um, mm -hmm. she kind of dressed tomboyish sometimes, right. but, uh, so I didn't really fit in, and I was very shy, um, um, extremely shy, especially since I, I didn't have a whole lot of socialization um, growing up other than in school. Right, right. So um, as far as uh, friends went then, did you have any, you know, 
particular friends, uh, like a best friend, or were you sort of just, you know, moving around and, you know, keeping to yourself? Well, in Vermont, I actually had one best friend who lived about uh, maybe 10 miles away, 20 miles away somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and my mother got to know his parents, and he actually lived in a house. He didn't have any running water or anything, but right. he was a really nice kid. And uh, so I got to hang out with him maybe once or twice, uh, you know, a year. Um, it wasn't really a whole lot, but he was... I'd ride with him on the bus every day to school and back. Right. So do you, and then when I got... Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to ask if you guys, uh, you and your friend or whatever, were you guys more of a special case or were there more kids like you that were more in that poor situation? Or were you, you know, sort of like a special case where other people, the majority of people, were probably better off than you? I'm just trying to get a picture here of, you know, the community and everything of that nature. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the other children, you know, they had they had some pretty normal um, lives from my perspective, and I just always kind of seeked out the people that I, I, I had closer relationships with the children that were a little more secluded or a little more different, um, and I felt I always felt the need to like be friends with them so that they had somebody. I didn't. I didn't really go towards the, the groups, the crowds, um, and that way everybody else was doing to fit in. It was never my thing. So more or less the kids that were sort of downtrodden or pushed away, uh, you, you sort of gravitated to them because probably you were feeling the same thing, right? In a way, uh, but being the older brother, um, I always looked after my little brother, so I think that that came into play too. Like I would help bullies if I seen or not help bullies, uh, help the bully. If I seen somebody getting picked on, you know, I would go and help them. I wasn't really, like, uh, violent or anything, but I would stand up for the, the week and... More like um, a protector. I got, yeah, yeah. And it's, I didn't, like... I wasn't all that, but I did try to do what was right. I, I don't know. There was just something in me. I used to, you know, watch she man and... Mm -hmm. um, you know, Voltron and uh, Thundercats and all the heroes. So I always, G.I. Joe, you know, so I, I always really wanted to do the right thing and, and be, and just, you know, be that for somebody. Right, right. So now you're in that junior high stage about uh, sixth or seventh grade, let's say about seventh grade or so. I think that's where we're sort of being right now. Um, so outside of, you know, being in, on the poor side of things and keeping to yourself, um, what what was going on with you? Okay, you're the protector there. Uh, now you said mom and dad, or was the stepdad still around then? Yeah, stepdad wasn't really patient with me, and he I always felt a cold shoulder, and it was kind of rough growing up. He every time me and my brother would get into any mischief, I I would take the wrath of the punishment mm -hmm. um, when me and my brother would be fooling around too early in the morning and wake him up uh, you know he slept uh, nude so he would come out you know naked and like angry extremely angry and scary and it, and, it, and he would you know take his wrath out on me yeah that would scare so me I seeing a naked guy coming at me at 2 o'clock in the morning that's, that's pretty <laughs> scary especially if you're young jeez yeah. <laughs> Amen, man. Yeah. Yeah. So so you went through uh through experiences like that, a little uh animosity between stepdad now about, about your mom. I mean, did your mom stick up for you guys? I know that you were saying earlier that she was a protector, okay? And you you know, protecting you guys, you probably picked up some of that from your mom. How was she with the stepdad with with the anger? Uh did she sort of lay back? Or did she lay into him? Or what was going on with that? Well, my memory, uh, a lot of it is, is faded. I only really remember the really bad stuff and the very few of the really good things. But yeah. she was always wore the pants uh, in the house. She was very uh, vocally uh, abusive. Yeah. And, and then I think he took it out on me. Yeah. And... 
Um, it was usually when she was grocery shopping or, uh, I don't know, it seems like she wasn't around or when he would attack me. And, and then he would come in and apologize. It was like, a, it was weird. He'd come in and apologize and make me feel bad, so I never told him, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I and that. then my mother... It seemed like she would like join in with him when when punishing me if me because my brother was always he's four years younger than me he was always the baby and I should know better so I usually got the punishment mm-hmm. and he always got the privileges like he got he never I never got to stay up later than him or when we went somewhere like to the grocery store uh, I could never sit in the front seat because he would cry and whine. So it was like, you know, he's younger than you. And so I never got the older brother um, privileges that some people say they get. I was always, I, I'm older and I should know better. And I, I you know, it was just strange. Yeah. He was like the favorite. Yeah, and you always taking the hit for everything, huh? For just about everything, For yeah. just about everything. And to this day, they, they all deny it, and it drives me nuts. Yeah, well, <laughs> praise God, man. God, God gives you a heart of forgiveness. Amen. So, Amen. Now you're you're in high school. Now, did you finish high school, or was high school a thing where you you dropped out? What happened with high school and and completing school? Uh, I dropped out okay. after um tenth grade because um, uh, I was anti authority. After that, because after my stepfather, I wouldn't let anybody pretty much treat me like that as I got older. Okay. I got more and more anti-authority. Wow. So so you drop out of this, uh, high school at, um, at 10th grade, okay, and now you have a bit of rebellion going on in you, uh, probably some anger going on. And so, how did that all fit in with being at home? Did you stay at home? Did you leave? Did you run away? What was going on with that? I got a job right away. I was uh, 18 or 17. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a landscaping job right away. And I ended up moving into a, like a boarding house um, where they just have rooms for rent. Yep. And then uh, I basically, it was kind of like a nonstop I wouldn't say bash house, but we partied a lot, and uh, all my friends would chip in for stuff, especially beer, and uh, their girlfriends would help pay rent, and so uh, basically, it was like uh, my room, it was a boarding house for everybody, and everybody chipped in and, and helped out with covering food and right. provision and rent. Sort of like a little commune going on there. Yep. Yeah, so... Now, before you moved out, uh, were you doing any drugs or drinking or anything like that, or did you find that you found yourself doing that when you started, you know, getting into this little commune situation with your own room and the boarding house and things? Well, my brother's father, uh, he he smoked pot most of, or marijuana most of uh, my childhood. I remember him having his brothers or friends come over, and so I always, like, smelled it, and I liked the smell. Yeah. So I started smoking uh, when I was about, I'd like to say 13 or 14. I started smoking pot and cigarettes um, basically to fit in to, because other kids are doing it and I wanted to be cool. Um, and so then it became a habit. And when I moved out on my own, it, there was a lot of drinking, um, smoking pot, and then occasional I mean, I, I've only binged a few times, a few nights or so here and there with, like, cocaine or things like that, but I never really got hardcore into drugs. Mm-hmm. So it was more drinking, more than anything? A lot of drinking, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so now you get yourself a job. You're, you're landscaping, uh, you're partying, you're living it up, you know, you're doing like most people do around, you know, those teenage years when they get out of their house, you know, they're finding their own way. Um yeah, you know, what happened after that? Did you stick with the landscaping uh, for a while? No, I, no, no. I went through so many jobs because I was hungover and called in to work. And yep, they they didn't like that. Yeah, so you know, progressing, going through the job after job. Okay, uh, obviously you were probably still partying, you know, doing what you're doing. 
Um, how, how did things end up going into your early 20s there? Well, about when I was 20, I met this, uh, my first son's mother. I had three. Um, and we were together for about eight months, and I got her pregnant. And uh, she cheated, and she was not faithful, so things started to fall apart. And then her family got involved. She was actually uh, black, and uh, her family didn't like me because I was white. And she came from a, um, her parents were both black, and her father had actually left her when she was young. And so her mother resented me and didn't want me anywhere around her daughter mm -hmm. because I not only was I, you know, a man, but I was a white man. And so that was difficult. Okay. Now, did, did uh, your first son's mom, um, I mean, did she do anything to try to keep you around or keep you in their lives, or did she pretty much push you away? We were really young, and she, and so, and like, we even keep breaking up and get back together, but she cheated on me repeatedly. Yeah. And I, and I just tried to, I, I couldn't give up, you know, I, I still loved her, and mm -hmm. I, I just, I've always wanted to know why she wouldn't love me here. And, you know, and nobody really chose me. It was, I was always on the back burner for, like, everything. Yeah. So I just wanted to keep until uh, she finally left and went with another man yeah. for good. Yeah, so that, I mean, if you're looking, you're still looking for that love and trying to reconcile things, and that's not there. That's That's really hard on a person. You know, and so, and on top of it, it doesn't seem like there's too much stability in your life as far as work and environment and everything of that nature. Uh, so now, you know, you have yourself a son. Now, were you trying to provide for the son, or were you just basically left out of their lives completely and, uh, you know, basically left alone? Uh, no, that's the thing is because I didn't have a good relationship and uh, or I didn't know my father. Um, I really always just wanted to. That was the like me in life was to be a good father, and that's why I wasn't uh, very careful with um, protecting myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a child, and I went to work, and I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with him during the first couple of years of his life because I was working and then she left and uh, you know I provided I did everything that I thought you know I that I had um, my stepfather he always provided you know what I mean but he wasn't loving and kind to me um, so I was loving and kind to my son while I was there but I also had that aspect where I need to go bust tail to make sure that he has everything he needs right Right. I, I can picture you doing that, just, you know, given, you know, the history of your life, and you seem to be a very compassionate person, okay, regardless of what's going on, you, the compassion still flows, amen, so, now you have your son, you, you have this sort of broken relationship, and now you're moving on, uh, you know, I'm assuming you're moving into your 30s by now, would that be correct? Uh, yeah, each, each time um, I would lose the relationship per se uh, I would have a long period of recovery where I would just basically you know party uh, have one night stands week night stands uh, uh, month uh, flings but I never you know I, it took me a long time before I let down my guard and try to fall in love again basically or settle down I would keep the women in my life at a distance Right. Now, I'm just curious, and, uh, you know, during this whole time, up to this point, did anybody ever talk to you about Jesus? Uh, did you hear anything about Jesus? Did you, you know, any any church, anything come into your life up until this point? Uh, no, just weddings and funerals. Just weddings and funerals, just the typical thing. And you never really had the urge to go hit church or anything like that. Obviously, you didn't go to church, so... I was just wondering if at any point up till now, 
you know, God was even a little inkling, a little speck somewhere floating around in your mind or not. Did you ever wonder, you know, uh, about God? Um, yeah, I used to, uh, when I was really young, because I grew up in the woods, if I see a dead animal or something, I would bury it, put a cross over it, pray. Uh, I don't know where I learned. I just knew that there was always a, a God, and I never knew him intimately or knew religion or read a Bible or any of that, but I did know that um, there was a God and there was a creator. I never believed. I never fell for the evolution stuff, right. ever. Right. So, so God instilled that in you, uh, without you knowing. <laughs> Praise God, man. So now you, Amen. now you're moving on. You're in your thirties, and uh, now were there any other relationships that that came into play? Now you said you had uh, three kids, uh, so we we, yep. we have one in the wind, Sada. And uh, how do we uh, end up with two more kids? Well, pretty much the same kind of stories, but the different circumstances. But the, each one, uh, it was basically awesome for the first eight months we were together. Mm -hmm. uh, we got along great, and then I'd get them pregnant very quickly. <laughs> and then it was uh, they're uh, pregnant, and, uh, you know, the, especially being young and, and uh, not being there, I was at work, so I couldn't. Uh, and I didn't really know how it was to be a good boyfriend, uh, per se, uh, like emotionally supportive mm -hmm. uh, during the, um, you know, the mood swings and the things like that and, and, the, and the lack of sleep. And, you know, I was just worried about providing. And I, I tried to be a good boyfriend, but not a good um, um, comforter because my mother was always the boss in the house. And so... I never took, I don't think I ever took that um, stability rule to encourage. I would try to fix every all the problems versus listening or um, just being there, if, he, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. I would try to fix it some way physically. Yeah, so now your, your two other children are from the same woman or different? No, each one lasted three years. It was eight okay. months, then nine months of pregnancy, and then um, about a year and a half to two years, or well, less than two years, of raising the, ba the baby, and then about when they were old enough to like start to speak and start to show personality, then um, it was like too much... I guess going on that they would leave me for uh, somebody else somebody. while I was at work. They were shopping around, I guess. Shopping around, yeah. So now there's something I'm curious about, and maybe other people are, uh, and I have no experience in this area, okay? But obviously you do. In, in your situation where you have several children, okay, we'll say three, with three different women, how how does that affect a person? Um, you know, just day to day living. Uh, I'm not sure right now, like after the third, what your job stability is and things of that nature. But how is how does that affect the person uh, when you you're compassionate like you and and you're going through you know um, these separations, uh, but you have a heart uh, obviously for the children. You know, what goes through your mind, I mean, in, in your heart, your actions? Can you explain just a little bit uh, of just your being, how you are, uh, you know, how you're operating during that? I don't know if I'd be able to deal with that myself. And um, I'm wondering, how do you cope with that? Uh, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, it took, it just, I kind of removed myself from reality um, in a way. Uh, and I try to think of all the positives versus the negatives. Mm -hmm. um, because if I dwell on it, it breaks me down. So, uh, and I still care about the, the women. I still care about my son's mothers. Uh, mm -hmm. And they pretty much hate my guts for some reason. And, and, and that's what put me basically to Jesus because uh, I couldn't understand. Uh, but 
this world takes advantage of good people. This world is caught. And I don't think the people. I can see the bigger picture and I see that their upbringing and their and the social um, statuses and the things have made people the way they are. So I don't, I don't, even my stepfather who, you know, wasn't very patient or kind to me, I don't blame them. I, I just blame the situation and it, and I try not to be the victim, but I try to just continue to try and um, just look and reach out and help anybody I can. It's not about what I get. It's not about getting something in return. Mm-hmm. I would love that. You know, it would be so wonderful, but it just hasn't really happened too much for me. Yeah, so... Um, uh, other Jesus. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, so with you, you mentioning now that, you know, Jesus is coming into the picture, how exactly did that happen? How did you actually just start falling into Jesus? Did you hear on the radio? Did you, you know, read it somewhere? Did you stumble upon a Bible? How, how did it happen? I don't, I couldn't really pinpoint a moment, but I know that I've always just felt that there's something bigger, that there's and I've, and I've always tried to find out, um, you know, I was a big studier of philosophy and existentialism. I wanted to know why I existed because okay. it just seemed like every, everything was just so wrong. I never quite fit into this world and, and the people and the masses and, the, and everything. So I just never knew why I was going through all this stuff. So I was constantly looking for reasons, and I've done lots of studies, and I've read, and I tried to read the Bible when I was old enough to figure out what it was, and and it was just kind of a story, you know. And you know, I watched the movies, you know, like Exodus and things like that, and um, so I kind of had a gist of the world's religion on it, and I never really got it. I never really agreed with it. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so I just kind of. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. No, I, I was just wondering. So, pretty much, um, you know, philosophy. It seems might have led you to looking into Christ. Then. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And just always like the coincidences that happened. You know, I never believed in coincidences. I thought that it was. It's a bigger picture. It's something that you know teaching me, and I learned a lot through that. That you know, lessons in life. Um, especially bad ones. Yeah. It's all, they're all teachers to teach you something. So now, how, how do you come to a conclusion that you need to serve Jesus? Was was there anybody that came along to help you along, or did you just come to this conclusion by reading the Word of God? Well, I have ran into strangers in my traveling. I travel quite a bit. I tried, I've always been looking for a home, you know, which yeah. isn't here, but and I've run into complete strangers that have been so kind to me, that have taken me in, that have fed me, that have, and I'm not, and I wasn't up there like poor or on the streets or any of that. It's just, really, I've always been led to to uh, a few really good people and profound conversations and just just genuine love. Um, but the, and that's like maybe two percent of the people I ran into where. The rest were either ignored you or, or rude or, you know. Uh, um, but those very few people, um, I don't, now that I look at looking back, I know I feel like Jesus sent them to me, or maybe they were angels in disguise, or, mm-hmm. um, and, and and you know more things I lost. No matter how hard I fought for them, no matter what I thought I was doing right. No matter how hard I worked and paid the bills, or, or uh, you know, I, I did everything for the women in my life that I that I've watched on like television and family sitcoms. You know, I rubbed feet, I bought presents for no reason, I'd bring home flowers, I'd do the dishes, uh, I'd clean the house, I'd help, and then and it never worked. So after doing all these things, and realizing that it's still not good enough. Mm-hmm. It, it, each thing I searched out was still not good enough. I tried yoga, I tried meditation, I tried 
um, Buddhism. I tried, it, and none of it ever works for me. Okay. So it all led to losing just about everything to the point where I was just, I gave it all to God. I said, God, if you're there, help me out. Right. Right. Well, praise God, man. So you gave it all to God. Now, how long ago was that? Um, I forgot what you said. You're 41. So when was that? Was that recently? Uh, just trying to find that defining moment uh, where you finally just gave it all up and said, that's it. Jesus, take the wheel, man. Just, <laughs> I'm done. You know, was that a couple of years ago? Uh, that was, um, uh, well, when I finally gave in completely. Yeah. Was about a month ago. But uh -huh. two years ago, I was, I started on that path of really searching and really looking for him okay. and giving up. But, uh, yeah, a month ago, I really got the, the, uh, the confirmation, the 100%. I always knew that he existed, but I never knew that I was worth anything or that, um, I was never for sure that I mattered, basically. Like, what am I? I'm just a, I'm just a grain of sand, you know, compared to, like, I, I didn't even want to ask for anything because, you know, I'm just a, what am I? What do I, you know, that's the outlook I had. So I, I didn't even want to bother the great and almighty God, my bull, you know, when so many other people are suffering or going through way worse than me. Right, right. There's that caring part of you, man. <laughs> man. So now you're kicking around uh, a month ago or so, uh, and you basically go all in. You know, so uh, what happened at that point? You, you go all in? Now, did you just, you know, I, I don't know about work or things of that nature, you know. Um, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about how you are now with, you know, so it's a month. So we'll call it right now. You know, what are you doing? What Are you just studying? What are you, what are you doing with your life now that you've come to this realization that Jesus is everything and everything else has failed you? Well, it started with this, the last ex, my, my third son's mother, who had locked me up, put me in jail. Uh, she, she said some horrible lies, and we live in a small town, so they didn't know who I was. And I'm I'm completely tatted and up and and I just look like a like a basically like a white supremacist if you want you know I got lots of skull tattoos and things and I had a shaved head and uh -huh. uh, um, and anyway um, it just went really bad for me really quick and I didn't really care because my heart was broken and I was depressed living in and out of my truck and she would take me back and then she'd kick me out and. I found out she was on, she was doing, uh, she was high, uh, highly involved in opiates and mm -hmm. uh, later on even heroin. And I didn't understand that, why she was always tired and sleeping. And, and then some days she was in a great mood. But she, I was going through her roller coaster with her. Mm -hmm. I had no clue about the drug until I went to jail. And then I was taught about it and the effects. Um, so while I was in jail, and basically, when I started picking up the, what they have in there, it's called the Daily Bread. Okay. And uh, and they have the Daily Passage. And um, so I, I started there, and I really just prayed. And I had a lot of time, you know, to talk to myself, which I thought was myself. But then I realized that I was basically talking to God. And, and then it just progressed from there. When I got out, I was really messed up. Um, I couldn't bounce back into real life, you know, because 18 months I was locked up and we didn't have anything okay. but a TV and books. And, uh, and then when you get back into the real world, so much has changed. Mm -hmm. um, the tech has advanced. Yeah. Uh, and everybody's just going about their day. And I mean, I, I, I was with 30 guys every day. And even though not all of us got along, we were like a family, you yeah. know, and we were close and tight-knit. And we worked out together, and we ate together, and we lived together. And then back in the real world, you go back into everybody thinks they're all socially uh, close, but they're all really physically separate. Right. And it was a huge culture shock. So I've just been kind of alone um, ever 
sense. And, and it just brought me closer to search Jesus and search God. And I searched through all the denominations so I would get it right this time because I didn't want to keep screwing up. So and it, they had all kinds of paths. So yeah. to, to here, yeah. So now in in the the jail or uh, prison, whatever, wherever you were for eighteen months, didn't don't they have? Uh, I know that I did a prison ministry at one time for a few years. Did anybody come in from the outside and like do church services, or did they have like a pastor or a priest or anything that came in? And did you involve yourself in any of that? If they did? Yeah, I was just in a county jail, but yeah, they had a Catholic uh, priest, I believe, who, or I don't know if he was a priest, because um, he came in in normal clothes and stuff, but yeah. we had a little room, you know, that was basically just another cell, but we'd go in there, maybe four or five of us once a week, sometimes once a month, depending on when he could show up. Right. He's a really old guy, he was really uh, um, crippled and a lot of a lot of issues going on with him, but he, uh, yeah, I'd go in there and I'd try and I'd cry, yeah. and and you know, I just felt a lot of weight every time I, I brought up God or anything. I just felt a lot of weight. Um, yeah, I've experienced guys do that um, where almost in. in uh, in the prison, uh, it, it was almost like a, a separate place, like a place of security. If you get into that room there, uh, where you you have a few guys, not everybody came out. And in my sense, uh, you know what I did, uh, but we'd have eight, nine, maybe sometimes twenty, but for the most part, eight or nine guys, and they were able to let down their guard and actually, you know, cry a little talk and everything, and then <laughs> when they would leave, you know, they start pulling their pants up and getting their tough guy yeah. image on and, and walking out and everything like that. So, uh, yeah, that, well, it's just, I was wondering about that, if there was anyone in there and, and maybe you had that, you know, at least that little space of time uh, to where you, you know, you, you can let some tears flow and, and have a little bit of a relief. A release. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so that's a good thing. So you get out now, and obviously this is a short time ago. Uh, so you're, you know, serving God. You're a little confused. You're going through basically what like a soldier would go through after being deployed and then coming home. Uh, you know, uh, being pulled away, having that camaraderie of you know your brothers and and everything, and then you basically thrown back to society where you don't have that structure anymore uh you know you had a routine when you were in there that's what you did you know you did this 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 and you did it day after day and now you get out and everything has just changed right there so how, how is jesus helping you with that you know being saved being a christian uh, I know that you've come in here to TDC and, you know, you're hanging out with us here in the Discord room uh, during the day. We're fellowshipping. Um, but how, outside of that, how is Jesus helping you day to day, especially dealing with that change that that you've gone through? Well, it's funny, right, right before I was getting out, I kind of, you know, I didn't want to come back to my hometown because I realized how small it was and now I'm a, I had this uh, this thing hanging over my head everywhere I went, and I didn't want to be part of that. So I uh, basically asked God, like, where, where can I go? Where should I go? And and I put a bunch of pieces of paper with different states that I would be interested in going to in a bucket, and I uh, picked Texas. So I drove to Texas with my sister from my my real father, which I only met a couple of times, but we decided to get to know each other, basically. Yeah. And um, so we drive to Texas, and I ended up in Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ, uh -huh. um, which I didn't even know about. I, and it's on the coast of uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And it was a beautiful place, but it was uh, during slow season, because um, I got out sometime in... Um, I think I left in uh, February. I got out around March. And uh, so it was slow there, but it, I got a job right away. I got a, a decent place right away. But then I wasn't, I basically uh, wanted to go to Arizona. So I left it all and thinking that Arizona would be just as easy to get my feet under me. And I completely just ruined everything and failed. And so I had to kill and come back home. Yeah. And, um, and so since I've been home, I've been pretty much 
locked up in my apartment. Uh, I was working with a couple friends that I knew um, doing stage handing and uh, some electrical work and some rigging. I was working for like three or four different companies, basically subcontracting for myself. I'd get emails and I'd go to work and was making really good money. Uh, and then, but they were, the more I got into Jesus and the more I started to uh, be religious uh, or have a relationship, I don't like to call it religion, um, the more I realized that these people were completely different than me because they were, you know, different um, um, sexual preferences and they were, they were younger than me and they were, uh, you know, one of them was a, was an avid Satanist and, you know, there was a lot of um, ABC stuff going on. But, um, yes. And so it just kind of fell apart. Uh, and since then, I haven't really bounced back physically, but I've realized that I don't really need or want anything. Um, and Jesus provides uh, one way or another. Mm-hmm. And the apartment I live in is my brother's wife's or girlfriend but they, they they've been together forever uh, they didn't go to the ceremony but um, and she only pays the, the taxes they, she owns the house so okay. it's like 500 bucks 400 bucks a month yeah and uh, and my mother helps pay both of our um, rents basically so okay that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, so, I mean, it seems like God's providing for you where you sort of took it upon yourself to go out and try to do things on your own and it didn't really work out. God brought you back to where you are and there is there is some provision for you there. So that's a total blessing in, in my opinion. Um, you know, and you're where you are and now we're under quarantine and lockdown and everything, which makes things a lot difficult, um, you know, until this thing passes. Um, so, but let's say things uh, sort of normalize and everything. You know, we're looking forward to you know having a rapture, having Jesus come back, right? Uh, but if we're here for any longer amount of time and things normalize, what do you think you do with your life? Um, do you think you pursue anything uh, with doing things for Jesus? You know, evangelizing or, or getting into any kind of full time ministry or just uh, kick it out there, go get some jobs and just continue evangelizing giving your testimony what what do you see for the future for you uh i've always been a man that lives in the present mm-hmm. uh so what would your desires uh, be? i always just want i really want to help in any way that i can yeah uh, and and i'm waiting for jesus to give me that signal to mm-hmm. to because uh, even jobs most of the jobs that i've gotten I, i'll be out there you know back in the day when you filled out paper applications I'd, I'd be out there all day every day and then a friend would call me up and I'd get a job through them so it was always like I really believe he's always been there and no matter how much I tried to get do something it was like no uh, this is what you're going to do and he just showed up for me except for now so and I believe he everything I had to break down and lose everything fleshly in order to come completely to him. And now I just trust completely in him. And whatever comes my way, I'll know it uh, when it comes. Because I, I, I see things more now. And like even this ministry or fellowship, um, um, uh, it brought me to Ravi Rob and PDC Radio. And then that brought me to Discord. And Discord brought me to you and the rest of the family. Right. And, I, and all of that was not you know I don't believe in coincidence and you know I'm where I need to be yeah perfectly and you guys have just basically pushed me over the edge of trusting and just letting go completely that uh, 100% and and that now I'm spiritually I'm okay I just you know whatever he wants me to do uh I would love to just help people in any way like lift them up if they don't have anybody because I see a lot of people are lonely and depressed and in this world and it's just a, a really sad thing mm-hmm. and so that's all I want to do I, I don't think I know the the word um, I can't memorize things
things that well, but I can I can express the overall feeling and the overall um, the philosophy of it, uh-huh. basically. Yeah. And and I just want to I just want to let people know that he loves them. Amen. So yeah, what would you tell people that are listening right now? Because we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, it's been about yeah, it's been almost an hour. Can you believe it? Um, so yeah, we're going to wrap it up. What what words of advice or what what do you have for somebody that out, that maybe maybe they went through things the same way you did, you know, a little bit poor. Maybe they had a lot of relationships that came up. Things were unstable. Maybe they went to prison or or something like that. Some bad things happened in their life. And now they're searching, and you know, obviously, you found Christ. Uh, what kind of words of advice? You know, just a short little spot. What, what would you say to people out there? Try to encourage them. I would say, don't give up, and um, love your neighbor, and and uh, no matter what, if you if you search for Jesus, He will pick you up, and He'll take care of you. Man, awesome. Praise God, man. Well, I mean, it's a great testimony. It doesn't matter if you've given your life to Christ two days ago or 20 years ago. Amen? Your testimony, man, is, is, is what makes that, that moment so, so special. You know, from all the things you go through and all the things you've been through, man, it, it makes, it's that defining thing for that moment to be so special and I believe that people are going to be touched by your testimony here what you've put out there I mean you've talked about a lot of things a lot of things that people wouldn't necessarily talk to because of pride you know uh, and you know just that love and compassion you have for people man you just let it flow and I appreciate that I'm sure the people listening right now appreciate that and um, and I can't thank you enough for for giving the time to come on here and uh you know we'll post it and and your testimony will go on forever as long as i guess the internet's around amen (laughs) (laughs) so i appreciate you uh cj uh and uh we'll tell everyone out there if uh if you're on Discord, uh, get the Discord app, D-I-S-C-O-R-D, period A-P-P, and uh, come over to TDC Radio Network and uh, check out, um, he's a sheepdog is what he is on there, and you check out CJ, she, uh, sheepdog, check us all out there. Now, uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, um, do you have a way for people to get in touch with you? Do you have an email address or anything that you could give people, or do you just want them to try to get, get you through Discord? Um, I have a, my YouTube is Berkshire County, or Burke County Sheepdog, um, and, uh, and I have an email, which is, um, wish, W-I-S-H, 2332, at com. All right. All right, so Berkshire County, or Burke, B-E-R-K, right, Burke County Sheepdog, that's your YouTube, uh, website. And then your email is wish2322 at hotmail. Am I correct? 2322. 2322. Two, two, two. Okay. 2332. <laughs> two, oh, 2332. Two. Okay, yeah. Don't, don't worry. I'm in my own world. 2332. Two, two. Yeah, well, then that's how I roll, man. <laughs> I'm all messed up. Anyways, praise God, man. All right, CJ. Well, thank you for coming on, and like I said, I'm sure everyone appreciates your testimony, wonderful testimony, and uh, obviously, I'll be talking to you on the Discord there, but, um, you know, you have a good day, and uh, again, appreciate you coming on. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, too, Lou. God bless and love. All right, I'm going to disconnect us now. All right, we'll see ya. Bye. Praise God, man. There is CJ, uh, Sheepdog. Uh, he's changed his name a few times on on the Discord, so he, he gets me. Uh, but Berkshire County Sheepdog, he's he goes by Sheepdog. His name is CJ over there on Discord server. So hey, we appreciate you listening in this morning to Christians Like Us show. Uh, we really appreciate the time when people come on, they give their testimonies. Uh, it always seems like um, 
you know people pour their hearts out man because they have a desire they have a desire for people to give their life to Christ especially in this day and age where uh, things are just so uncertain they really are uh, you know things are going crazy in this world and people man they're full of fear they have no direction they they don't know where to go and uh, we want to encourage you man to reach out to Jesus Christ ask Christ to come into your life and to set you free man to show you the way to go all right to be that comfort in this time of need that we have out there amen so with that I'm gonna wrap it up I'm gonna uh, what am I gonna do oh I wanted to let you know again if you wanted to get a hold of CJ okay go check out his YouTube channel Burke B-E-R-K County Sheepdog okay look for that on YouTube or if you want to send them an email it's wish W-I-S-H 2332 I got it right wish 2332 at hotmail.com and again thank you CJ for coming on I appreciate it check us out next Wednesday we'll have another testimony and uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we are going to continue on in the end times we'll be wrapping this study up pretty soon we're going to be talking about Christ delivering the kingdom to the Father okay this is after the millennial period all right the old heaven and earth being destroyed in the new heaven and earth man we're gonna be talking about the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and how it's gonna be perfect in every way so don't miss that tomorrow at 9 a.m. and today is Wednesday so uh, tomorrow night also will be Jenny C with the SOS uh, show and uh, tonight I believe maybe will be Robbie Rob it depends uh, if he's trucking around his state with his special equipment he has his exemption to drive all over the place when everyone's in lockdown so he may be working we don't know but tune in for nine o'clock uh, at tdcradio.com okay the player is there you can go to islu islou islu creations.com forward slash radio a player is there also and all of the shows for the you know what i'm saying show and christians like us show will be uh on islu creations.com forward slash radio also this show will be posted on youtube on transfiguration day channel on youtube so if you want to listen to it again you can listen to it there it'll uh, only be the audio with some pictures and things of that nature i have to take the audio and make it into a video or you can go to the discord server and uh, you can listen to it on the shows on demand it'll be posted there probably within 20 minutes or so all right so with that it's your host red words lou another christians like us show is in the past man and uh what i wanted to do i would just want to play a little song here uh, to wrap it up it's called confined existence by scotty e from reigning redemption our friend scotty e and his wife shawnee e have a wonderful ministry we all know that scotty e is the one man band and he puts together all this wonderful music man he does a great job and uh, his wife has uh, her ministry also so they have a great ministry and uh, check them out over there reigningredemption.com and reigning redemption on YouTube so let's listen to a little bit of uh, Scotty E here confined existence and with that we'll wrap it up so I'll see you tomorrow morning in Jesus name you know what I'm saying see ya truly live in the liberty of Christ where are the fruits thereof where are the weapons of our warfare we laid them down in the face of adversity you're fighting an enemy that's already defeated victory is yours Anybody can put the armor of God on. But Satan fears the believer that knows how to use it. Don't let circumstances determine your outcome. Your faith determines your outcome. Who told you you can't win? Who told you? He came to set the captives free. It comes down to a decision. Make the decision to walk in his freedom. To walk in his light. Do not let the chains bind you anymore. We have received all the means to live a victorious life. And that victorious life is the Word of God. 
You live it. You breathe it. You speak it. And you walk it. You're listening live to WTBCDB, Transfiguration Day Radio. Praise Jesus, man. 